Uh, so we try and give you guys a bit, a bit of variety. And in line with uh, uh, Blockchain July, um, I'm very happy to present to you guys uh, Alessandro, uh, founder of legal firm LX20. Um, he's also, if I'm not mistaken, a, a dual qualified attorney, a current PhD student in nuclear law, and most importantly, he's a fintech enthusiast uh, with education experience which spans from Italy to the UK uh, all the way to the USA. So uh, welcome, Alessandro. Thanks. Thank you for having me. No worries. So um, before we get started, before you can start presenting, I'll just do a quick housekeeping for everyone on the call. So if any of you guys have any questions during the call, please feel free uh, to write your question in the chat or I can come and unmute you guys after the, the presentation. Um, so without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, Alessandro. Thanks, uh, thanks, Matteo. I'll uh, right get I'll get right into the presentation. Uh, let me just start off with um, a little bit about myself. Hopefully, this works. Here I am. There you so go. a little bit on me. Um, I promise to keep this as short as possible. Um, I was born and raised in Milan. I'm a graduate from Università Bocconi. I studied law, worked at law boutiques and global firms. Um, I have two LLMs, one in oil and gas in Aberdeen, Scotland. I never could master the accent, if anyone's wondering. Um, and then I have an LLM in uh, US legal studies. I attended Washington University in St. Louis School of Law. I'm doing my PhD in Aberdeen, Scotland. Uh, it's, it's a distance program, so I'm uh, working at the moment. I'm, I have my own firm, uh, and it's in advanced nuclear technology. So. Uh, uh, right from the get-go, you can uh, really appreciate how um, how much of an enthusiast um, I am about technology and innovation. Um, I founded the LX20 law firm uh, here in Italy in, uh, well, 2020, uh, just before lockdown. Uh, and it's a firm specialized in fintech, insurtech, and regtech. So um, the intersection between technology and regulated markets. And um, specifically, um, payment services, uh, financial services, and blockchain. I uh, speak a lot, uh, hopefully um, saying intelligent things at uh, conferences, on, especially on FinTech and DLT, that's distributed ledger technologies. So basically, the, the great family in which we um, uh, classify blockchain. Uh, I'm a dual qualified attorney. I'm qualified to practice law both in Italy and in the state of New York. Uh, so right uh, to the core of the presentation, I'll cover basically five sections. Um, the first is from the quill to the blockchain, so change of perspective. I'll uh, get into a little bit of how law and technology interact. Um, I'll then focus on the crypto universe. So I'm trying, I'll try to keep this as uh, entertaining and as light and enjoyable as possible. Um, I'll hopefully be able to give you a couple of hints on how I see lawyers, um, next generation lawyers, um, like to think of myself as being a next generation lawyer. Uh, you'll be the judge of that. And uh, finally, a little bit of a closing section. I'll wrap it up and hopefully it'll be uh, questions. I'll be happy to take any questions at the end of the presentation. So from the quilt to the blockchain. Um, so, well, this presentation is all about what's not in the presentation. So uh, to make myself very, very clear from the beginning, this is not about teaching anyone about blockchain, uh, given, giving you, uh, the audience, uh, any real content on blockchain. This is not the purpose of this presentation, but rather um, to convey what I believe is the change in paradigm, the paradigm shift in the profession. So how blockchain is a very, very good example of how lawyers are evolving and should evolve and should embrace technology and innovation in new ways. So uh, this first section from the quilt to the blockchain, we lawyers are trained to do essentially four things, to know the law, usually by heart, apply law to cases, use critical legal thinking and behave in a lawyerly way. Question is, is this wrong? Is this incompatible with a next generation lawyer? Not at all. In fact, this is the basis, but it's not the entire picture. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, I will have given you a, a, a broader picture, a, a larger picture of what a next generation lawyer um, should, should be, the skills uh, a lawyer should have. 
So let me just give you an example. Uh, we don't have to read this, but just to provide you, a com uh, I think, a good example of what traditional law is as compared to new problems in law. Uh, on the left, you can see a question um, out of my MBE exam prep book, uh, which I used to study for the New York bar exam. Uh, it's very traditional law. Uh, it's about um, disclosure requirements, very traditional. And on the right, you see another type of question, which essentially is based on blockchain technology and how blockchain technology interacts with uh, securities law and law on, on financial services. So this is just to give you an idea of how uh, questions can exist, both in traditional law and no surprise there, but how today we have to deal, next generation lawyers have to deal with new questions. And then we'll see, and this is the slide I'm very interested in, uh, answer to the question on the left is no. And then, uh, of course, you can just read through the question and the answer, and it uh, should be apparent why the answer is no. But on the right, we can see that uh, new terms are popping up uh, in these problems, and the answer is a bit more complicated. In, in this case, it's possibly. We are not sure uh, how, in some instances, new technologies are interacting with the law. So in a way, it's, so it's uh, the frontier of the legal profession. We have to not so much improvise as to embrace transformation, embrace change, and be able and be ready to face challenges. And in fact, you can see in red, for example, some expressions are entirely new, basically unknown to the ordinary traditional lawyer, such as decentralized platforms, DEFI, tokens, uh, blockchain technology. These are all new concepts which carry with them a lot of meaning, a lot of consequences, both on a legal and regulatory level, uh, and, and they're all to be explored if projects are to be uh, carried out and perfected and uh, an industry is to be born out of this new technology. So what does innovation mean in the legal sector? It does not necessarily entail relearning a trade. So uh, lawyers, traditional lawyers, need not uh, throw away all that they know, all that they can do, and somehow reinvent themselves. In fact, traditional lawyers uh, must still have a very, very good grasp. And of course, next generation, next generation lawyers must also have a very good grasp of uh, the basic ingredients, the basic instruments, such as a strong grasp and understanding and knowledge of existing law, be able to use crit critical legal thinking, having a method or process to navigate complex issues. This is really, really important, and have the appropriate mindset to either question established rules or suggest new interpretations. And this is where new lawyers, next generation lawyers, are um, needed to deal with new problems. And this is where uh, all that is known and all the skills and one mass master to be a good lawyer um, has to have to be used to deal with uh, new problems, which do not have a clear-cut solution. So uh, just, you know, the premises are uh, basically these. Well, innovation and technological development are unstoppable. So there is no stopping uh, development of technology and uh, exploration and science. This is a basic fact. Um, it's either about developing something new, new products, new services, or learning new ways mastering new ways to perform known activities. And of course, when you change the way products or services or the way you provide products or services, you create entirely new markets with new players, new relationships, new balances. And this is all part of the process. And of course, the more disruptive the technology, then of course, the, the, the higher the chance that some rules might not apply or might not efficiently regulate new phenomena or may yet again work perfectly well this is not something that you can we can discount so of course rules can still work and do still work but some rules may not be optimal so this is where you need to learn a bit a little bit about interpretation and being um open-minded as much as you know compatible with the legal profession and this is an ongoing process. So in this slide, you can see uh, uh, it's not you know, the happiest of slides, but just to get a point across, 
Uh, on the left, you can see protests about uh, uh, you know nuclear technology and the use of nuclear weapons. On the right, of course, uh, nuclear explo explosion. Why is this relevant? Well, before humanity learned how to split the atom, we had no nuclear issues, right? We did not know about radioactivity, or we did, but not associated with uh, military uses of nuclear technology. And now, of course, we do. So here it is. Uh, we first developed the technology, and here in this slide, you can see how the development of technology has spurred legal development, legal transformation, legal evolution. Today we have a lot of treaties uh, dealing with uh, non-proliferation, so um, basically preventing nuclear weapons, nuclear technology for military uses from um, being you know, distributed. Uh, we have peaceful uses of nuclear technology. We have very, very complex regulations on how to build and manage and decommission nuclear facilities. So again, the paradigm is you develop the technology and the law will adapt. It's an ongoing process. It's it has happened in the past and will happen in the future. And building on uh, nuclear fission, so splitting the atom, today we have, for example, nuclear fusion. This is something I'm dealing with in my PhD. And of course, nuclear fusion means new technology, uh, novel technologies such as, uh, you know, very, very powerful magnets and uh, superconductors and uh, sub-zero cooling apparatus. And of course, this is not contemplated in today's regulations on uh, nuclear fission. So nuclear fusion, no uranium, no plutonium, very different technology. And the question is, how do we adapt existing regulations to address you know, the new issues which might arise from this technology or to regulate this technology differently? Perhaps because it's safer and we can do without a lot of the restrictions and a lot of the uh, regulations we have in place because of course fission is dangerous so this is an example as you can see you know from the splitting of the atom to the fusion of atoms how technology will spur and will incite um legal development and you know just to connect with uh modern day events of course Elon Musk and SpaceX and all about uh, private companies exploring space and, and sending rockets into space, then of course we have a paradigm shift right here. Uh, we are used to seeing uh, government-led missions in space. So we have in place today, and this is a fact, we have treaties which deal with government-led exploration and um, you know, development of space programs. But today, Private companies such as SpaceX and many others do have the technology to explore and start exploring space, both you know uh, space close to Earth uh, orbits around Earth or uh, space a little bit further out. And we're talking about, for example, is exploration of Mars or the Moon or other celestial objects. So again, the law will adapt. Will face new challenges and will regulate, hopefully effectively and efficiently for all mankind, will adapt to address new issues. So again, you see this transformation is ongoing, it happens every single day, and it's unstoppable. So today we deal with SpaceX, tomorrow perhaps something different. And just to uh, give you uh, a piece of trivia, this is a fun thing. Well, if you've seen, if you've watched the movie The Martian, uh, you know, at one point the actor um, addresses the issue of being a space pirate and colonizing other planets. Well, this is actually a real thing. It's a real question in law, one which we will have to address, hopefully effectively, in the future, hopefully in the near future. But at some point, we will have to address that kind of issues. And of course, in very, very broad terms, in general terms, technology will affect a host of different areas of the law. Internet, artificial intelligence, new telecommunication technologies, digital tech, cloud computing will all exert some kind of effect on existing areas of law. And these go from new rights. So we have a new rights given to us by the fact that we have new technology to liability. So who pays if something goes wrong? How we deal with personal data, how we uh, perfect and execute contracts, how we transfer rights and exercise rights, and uh, so on and so forth. So again, it's an ongoing process. And lawyers stand, well, next generation lawyers, if you're into innovation and this area of transformation, then 
they basically sit at the intersection between technological development and law. And this is really interesting because you need to know a little bit about both. Of course, you know, you need to know about the law, but you cannot do without some kind of grasp of technology. We'll get uh, to that point later in the presentation. So let's take blockchain. It's Blockchain July, so it's only fair we start with blockchain as an example of what a next generation lawyer has to face in dealing with blockchain issues. So blockchain is basically a technological substrate which was developed initially in 2009 with you know, Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper on Bitcoin. That's the first example of functioning blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And of course, Bitcoin being the progenitor of all other cryptocurrencies. And at its simplest form, simplest explanation of blockchain, it's all about creating a technological, a technological substrate with two main features. First, a distributed ledger. A single ledger containing all transactions is duplicated among all nodes, and nodes are peers. There is no central node, and if you see the image on the left, it's a bit different from what happens usually in the financial and banking sector, where, we're, where we do have central nodes. Banks are effectively central nodes, and they all respond to a central authority, which might be a central bank. In blockchain, we have peer nodes, so basically nodes in a peer-to-peer -peer system, and they all behave and are all regulated by the protocol which binds them. Second feature which is important is the block in blockchain. So effectively, in blockchain, data is compressed using hash, fun hash functions in blocks. Each block is then uh, somehow, uh, you know, a, a hash output is generated from that block and then input inside another block, the subsequent block. This creates a chain and thanks to the properties of the hash function, it's all very secure. So blockchain was developed to allow the transmission of information. Now whether we consider that information to be, you know, the content of your wallet, how many bitcoins you have, or financial information, it doesn't really matter. And we'll see how blockchain can be used and has been used and will probably be used in the future for financial applications and what that carries in terms of legal effects and legal consequences. And here it is. This is uh, basically a, a very simple schematic which shows how uh, a phenomenon known as ICO, initial coin offerings, has taken the world by surprise. In basically 2017, that was the critical year in this phenomenon, we've had a lot of companies issuing tokens and associating rights and other legal effects to these tokens, amassing enormous amounts of money in minutes sometimes, um, hours, days at most. And of course, many of these ICOs have failed. Investors have lost their money, they have invested and have lost their initial investment. And of course, uh, this schematic, this, this basically this diagram, this process is very, very similar to what normally happens in the world of finance. We have an issuer offering financial instruments, uh, investors investing and hopefully uh, receiving a reward for their investment. And of course, our entire financial world has developed to protect investments, uh, investors and markets from abuses and mistakes and all sorts of negative consequences which might arise from uh, misuse of uh, these processes. And just to give you an idea of how much money we're talking about, uh, it's billions. It's literally billions of dollars uh, in ICOs, uh, especially you see the EOS ICO, the Telegram ICO, we'll get back to the Telegram ICO in a minute. They all collected and uh, you know, received funding in the order of thousands of millions of dollars, billions. Again, this is unheard of and in some way has created a massive wake uh, in the financial world because of course everybody uh, questioned how these ICOs could be legal and could be um, regulated effectively given that other players, financial intermediaries, all must abide and must follow established rules. But of course, we know the blockchain is a little bit different, right? It's not about single intermediaries 
uh, offering financial instruments. It's about peer-to-peer -peer nodes and uh, individuals accessing this technological substrate and having access to this uh, widespread technology with no established place of origin. It's effectively a global technology. Has, of course, uh, caused a lot of, you know, a lot of questions, a lot of doubts, a lot of hands have been raised in understanding how the existing rules, the existing frameworks must apply to blockchain uh, and must be, or must be somehow, you know, interpreted differently, applied differently to govern effectively and efficiently in this new phenomenon. And just to give you an idea of how complex this process is, uh, I've created this slide. And you can see in this slide just how many variables we have, how many aspects we have to take into consideration. For example, if a product, a token is negotiable, if it's not, uh, what kind of rights are incorporated in tokens and whatnot. So it's a lot of variables. It's a lot of information. Uh, and all of this is an ongoing process. So next generation lawyers, lawyers dealing with blockchain uh, must be cognizant of this process and must, of course, understand the process and follow the development of the markets and understand what kind of laws are being put in place, uh, what laws are can be, uh, you know, uh, not applied to the uh, single issues and so on and so forth. So it's a very, very complicated process, but it's very rewarding. You're effectively, you're building a new system, a new ecosystem, which is personally, I think it's one of the most rewarding activities a lawyer can, uh, you know, can, can, can do in, uh, in his career, his or her career. But interestingly, uh, you know, old law, traditional law is still key in this process. So just to give you an idea, this, is, this should be a, a fun slide, so hopefully you'll, uh, you'll find this uh, uh, entertaining. Uh, you know, the, the, the Swiss regulator has uh, done a lot of work in the blockchain space. They have provided us with uh, a map, a uh, classification of tokens, what tokens mean, are, there, uh, are they securities? Are there uh, utility tokens or not securities? Um, and they've provided us with a map criteria which we can use to navigate these waters. But interestingly enough, authorities worldwide have somehow used and embraced a, a very similar approach. They've said, well, if it's a security and we know how to identify securities, then why should we not deal with these tokens like we deal with securities. So apply the complex rules, which in the United States, in Europe, in single member states, all lawyers must know and must apply to uh, you know, the issuance of financial instruments. And to quote a duck expert, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then probably it's a duck. Uh, uh, this should be entertaining, but the, the, the bottom line is, old law still exists. So being a next generation lawyer does not mean, and I want to be as clear about this as possible, it's not about disregarding existing law. It's about knowing the law and adding on top of this knowledge something different, something more. New skills, new passion for technology, uh, uh, new insights, and just a lot of exploration, a lot of personal exploration in these areas of law. And you remember about, uh, I was telling you about the Telegram ICO. Well, here it is. Uh, the SEC has, in fact, the SEC is the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's the authority in the United States uh, responsible for dealing with securities and securities laws. Well, they've basically halted the ICO I was telling you about because it did not comply. It's not compliant, allegedly, of course, with existing laws. And again, it's a process. You can see that technology has, of course, created innovation and has raised hands and doubts among scholars, among lawyers, among entrepreneurs about uh, what, you know, what the effects are in terms of applicable law, but the law is still there. So it's about navigating and understanding and applying the law correctly and where possible, you know, finding new uh, areas where you can advance the interpretation of existing law, you can provide additional services and, uh, you know, just use what you know, what you have to support innovation 
And this is the most important part, it's the most difficult part of being a next generation lawyer. Of course, part of the blockchain phenomenon is our smart contracts. You might have heard them. Uh, these are essentially portions of codes, lines of code. You can see here, this is an example of a very, very simple smart contract. And there's been a lot of discussion about are these contracts, do these bind parties, do we understand what's in smart contracts? You can see this is basically uh, code. And of course, uh, once you put natural language, such as the comments you see, um, in this, you know, in, in the smart contract that I've provided you, uh, well, the question then becomes: How do these uh, portions of code interact with existing contract law? Because we know how to do, how to build and execute a normal contract, but do these laws, do these rules apply to smart contracts? And this is an open question. We're slowly developing our understanding of smart contracts and finding each country is, you know, is exploring this. Um, just finding the right way to regulate these contracts. And here you see, this is a slide which uh, is supposed to uh, convey the different approaches to this problem. You can see on the left, uh, the Italian solution. We have an Italian definition of smart contracts. Uh, right at the center, you can see how the Tennessee code in the United States, the state of Tennessee, deals with smart contracts. And on the right, you can see the California civil code. So again, it's about uh, it, it's, a, it's an issue, it's a challenge for both legislators and lawyers to understand how to effectively regulate uh, new technologies and new phenomena. So, uh, you know, again, what about the law? Well, innovation and blockchain are not an excuse to disregard existing law. I, I said this uh, on multiple occasions, and I still stand by this, this basic principle, basic rule, to be a new generation lawyer, you must know the law. It's not about inventing the law. It's not about, you know, creating, uh, you know, you know, applying the law we would like to see in books, in codes. But it's about knowing the law. This is fundamental. Of course, a measure of adaptation is required. You must understand how technology works if you are, if you want to be in a position to apply the law effectively. So, if a client comes to you and you know, proposes a, a brilliant new project about some kind of fascinating new uh, form of you know, new blockchain technology, new telecom technology, then you must understand how technology uh, is new in respect to you know, other existing technologies and how, what kind of issues it poses, what kind of challenges, legal challenges it poses uh, to be able to provide you know, your clients with valuable uh, uh, counsel. And of course, keep an open mind. Um, the law can be changed. The law can be interpreted as part of the of the trade, as part of the deal uh, when being a lawyer. So, uh, with you know being very cautious, it's not about inventing. It's about cautiously interpreting. But there is a margin of you know a, a degree of uh, freedom in just how we interpret, understand the law, and apply it to actual cases. And, well, there is nothing wrong in being the first. Uh, here, these are uh, two bits of news. I've, um, you know, these are snapshots from the internet. And you can see we have on the left the first um, issuance of uh, financial instruments, uh, convertible financial instruments on blockchain hyperledger. On the right, we can see uh, assets being, you know, the first operation where the first deal where assets were being uh, provided to uh, a startup company uh, in the form of cryptocurrencies. Two new uh, deals, there's nothing wrong in being the first. So exploring and supporting new disruptive ideas is not wrong. It's, in fact, a part of uh, the profession. Of course, always be cautious that being the first requires a lot of understanding of what the law is and where you can innovate and where, unfortunately, you must still uh, follow existing rules, and perhaps innovation is prohibited. Uh, and this is this should be a, a fun slide. Being a next generation lawyer is about embracing technology. You must really have a passion for technology. It's not just about reading about it. It's not about uh, you know every once in a while opening Google and googling uh, something which is interesting. It's about staying abreast of technological development. It's about having a passion where uh, it could be for coding, it could be for hardware, it could be for computers, it could be for space exploration. 
Uh, this is a bit, a little bit about my life. On the right, you can see uh, a vacuum tube-based amplifier. This I built uh, with my own hands. And it's one of my passions. Uh, technology is something I really believe in. I like to um, deal with, of course, as a lawyer, this is just a hobby. But staying always informed about the latest developments is fundamental. Uh, it's about being always up to date, understanding new technology, where technology can take us, and how we can anticipate technological development. But, uh, more on this later in the presentation. And here it is. Uh, for example, self-driving cars. Uh, fantastic. Brilliant development of technology. We know Google is working on it. We know a lot of companies, a lot of car manufacturers are working on it. And we, we read uh, these headlines and, you know, a next generation lawyer should go, wow, this is fantastic. This is the first response, I believe, that should come to mind. But the second is, okay, so self-driving cars, what do I know about driving cars? Well, I know about liability, I know about rules, I know about, you know, uh, how I need the license to drive a car. So a next generation lawyer should be trained to ask questions, to inquire. Let us take a look at some questions. I'm not saying these are all the questions which come to mind, but just look at uh, a couple of questions here. So self-driving cars, what about liability? Who pays if something goes wrong? Who pays if a car crashes into a building or, God forbid, someone? Who writes the codes, the lines of code, which deal with the artificial intelligence which provide the rules of conduct embedded in the car. How is this, all of this, going to fit in the world of insurance? Do we have insurance for this? Are insurance companies ready to provide us with insurance coverage? So these are just a couple of questions which, to a trained lawyer, should come to mind. It's not, it's not just about reading self-driving cars. Wow, fantastic. This is great. I hopefully will have a textbook in a few years on how to deal with the legalities of self-driving cars. It's about anticipating change, asking questions, and you know, seeing where the law, where this development can take us. Not necessarily about creating the law or having clients, but just keeping abreast of technological development and asking the right questions. And this, just to give you another example, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, decades ago, people read Asimov, Isaac Asimov, and read about the laws of robotics. And they probably thought, well, this is fantastic. This is science fiction. Who knows? In you know, 2150, we'll have artificial intelligence. Well, you know, artificial intelligence is something very real today. And even though we don't, we don't have uh, artificial intelligence, which is self-aware, you know, the, the whole Terminator apocalyptic scenario, we do have artificial intelligence. And you know, the European Commission and other authorities, other states are asking questions. How should we regulate artificial intelligence? Are the laws of robotics, the three laws of robotics Asimov has given us, something we should you know we should use are they uh, an indicator of what we should embed forcibly in all forms of artificial intelligence are we supposed to have a common set of rules to imprint in artificial intelligence these are all very very interesting questions and these questions will require answers in i think it's just a few years and in fact right today you can see this is a snapshot from uh, a document from the European Commission, we have white papers. We are actually addressing this issue right now. So we, the, the law is developing in this area. And a next generation lawyer, if artificial intelligence is your thing, should keep abreast of these developments and should try and ask the right questions, understand how old, old or traditional laws apply to artificial intelligence and how perhaps traditional laws can be changed, can be amended, to effectively regulate in a very in a optimal manner, in a very efficient manner, this new phenomenon. So here it is. This is the end of the presentation. And just to leave you with uh, food for thought, as, uh, as we usually say in, in these circumstances, well, being an exclamation lawyer is about, of course, uh, what I told you about. So blockchain, artificial intelligence, um, medical research, um, 
software development, artificial intelligence and robotics, space exploration, genetics, all these brilliant areas of science and you know development of human knowledge. But the most important uh, slide in this presentation is the one which you won't find here. The next page, the next chapter. So as a lawyer, you can either have a, an active approach to the law or a passive one. I would suggest that for next generation lawyers, an active approach is to be preferred. So ask yourself, what is the next big thing? What is the next technology? What am I seeing in the market? Am I seeing space exploration? Am I seeing artificial intelligence? Uh, am I seeing advanced nuclear technology? And what are the legal consequences? How can I prepare myself? How can I study? How can I more effectively provide counsel if these matters arise in the future? If I am called to provide a client with my expertise and legal counsel on these issues. So again, I provided you with insight in some areas of the law, but by all, by all means, consider these examples. And I would suggest anyone who's interested in pursuing this career, which I find I'm a little bit biased, of course, but I find it's a, it's a beautiful career and you can really provide a, a valuable service to your community and to humanity as a whole. I would go so far as to say you can be part of change, part of uh, development of human knowledge. But if you're a lawyer, then your duty lies with the law. How can the law help? in you know, developing these areas? How can we help in transporting and conveying the effects of science to the community? How can we help people, entrepreneurs, develop more technology? How can we, how can we help human beings benefit from advancements in human understanding and human knowledge? So uh, these are, I, I guess this uh, terminates my presentation. Hopefully you, find, you found this interesting. Any questions, fire away. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro, for your presentation. That was really insightful. I like the way you were talking about The Martian, the film The Martian, that, you know, we can, it's all a film that we can relate to and really reflects the pace of change, I guess. Um, and I think we have a, a few questions in the, in the chat for the 20 or so people in this call. But before I uh, pick the questions out, I had the one or two myself just to get things started and maybe to give some time for, for others to come up with some questions if, if, if the, they have. So, I mean, my, my first uh, question when you were talking about this whole topic is, you know, in regards to legal evolution, um, how fast do you think legislation is keeping, I mean, do you think legislation is keeping pace with the pace of development of technology that we're seeing across the board? Uh, well, it, it's a very, uh, thank you for your question. I mean, it's, no it's absolutely a fantastic question, but one which is, um, I think, a little bit too complex to answer. I'm yeah. not sure I can really, uh, no I, I can talk about what everyone in the world is doing in this regard, but I, I will say this. Um, we, the, the, the speed of development is actually, we are accelerating. Um, mm. If you think about it, uh, we've, we've explored, we've uh, developed more knowledge in these past, I would say, 40 years than we've had than we've done in the past 150. So, yeah. in, a, in a way, as technology is you know gaining speed, so is the legislature. And of course, it's not a, um, it's a complex process because every single time you regulate anything in the world, well, and, and these and this is where you know the American school of uh, legal um, uh, the, the economics of uh, um, uh, legislation and you know uh, the economic analysis of law comes into play you need to consider all stakeholders and you know all interests and all angles and find the best balance so just to give you an example um, nuclear fusion well you know we are I, I, I propose actually have a paper out there on SSRI and on nuclear fusion uh, and I've, I've completed a paper three years ago two three years ago and today we are starting, you know, I've seen law firms getting into this kind of what should we do about the existing law on fission? And of course, uh, before we can get to the point where we have a basically complete set of rules, it will take time. Uh, but as, as I said, lawyers can play 
and play an integral part in this process because you need to be part of change. I, I'm sure a lot of people connected uh, in this, in, in you know, to this chat, to this event, uh, can provide valuable insight. I mean, if you start asking the right questions and you can, you know, you write papers and and you provide your reasoning, your arguments, your analysis, uh, do so. Please do so. This is all part of the change. You cannot expect governments to be, you know, perfect. So if you feel you have it in you to give something back and uh, provide some valuable insight, please do. By all means, this is the way that the law changes. And if you're lucky, you can be part of the change. So I'm, I'm not sure this answers your question at all, but it's, it's kind of to give you an idea. It's an ongoing process. Countries are more, you know, more, um, uh, you know, uh, reactive to this kind of change. Others are less so, but it's accelerating. I can definitely say it's accelerating. No, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine it's extremely co complex what we're seeing. And uh, I think the, the things that we're trying to do here, trying to give people a voice, trying to get to network, uh, is trying to share knowledge as much as possible, because I think we need each other's knowledge as much as possible. I mean, one of the major challenges I see is the digital divide, but when it comes to talent, so when it comes to skills and knowledge, I think that's where we may be uh, lacking a little bit. And I think that's where we need to invest a bit more to keep pace with technology and to move into the future. Um, cool. So I think uh, there's a question from uh, Danny Anwar uh, in the chat. Uh, Danny, if you could unmute. Uh, I believe you had a question. You're right. Can Hi, Danny. Me? How you doing? Yeah, I can hear you. All good. Oh, nice one. Uh, Alex, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Thanks for that presentation. Very insightful. Um, I just my question was really uh, more about yourself. Like uh, this topic of tech law, it's quite a niche topic, um, and you seem quite you know you, informative about it, and uh, you're into it. I just want to ask, like, in terms of your background, what made you what made you um, want to learn more about this and go down this route right uh well thanks for the question um i guess it all boils boils down to um you know how you feel when you are you know when you look at technology i mean do you find do you find it interesting do you have a passion for it in my case i i study law of course i'm a lawyer my background is legal but you know i, I think I've, I've shown you um this so basically this the, these are my creations yeah. uh, this is the result of having a, a, a passion in me for technology and hardware specifically i'm not i like software of course but i'm more of a hardware person myself yeah. so i guess um th there is no cutting corners you, you need to have passion for technology if you feel it if you feel you have it in you to you know read up on technology understand it ask questions for example if you like science and you know you find yourself reading about specific technology on google then that's a great start mm -hmm. you know just read about a technology and then put yourself in the in the shoes of a lawyer and ask yourself okay so this is brilliant but how does this you know how does this fit into existing law so if you look at self-driving cars of course look at how cars and driving is regulated today but the, i think the, the starting point is to know about the law, of course, uh, but to have a, an interest for uh, science and technology and development in general. So, and just to be very, very clear on this, uh, it, you, you need not be a coder or, uh, you know, a, a nerd or, or, you know, know how a soldering iron works. But still, if you, if you feel technology is, you know, part of your daily routine, you read up uh, on Google about technology, then you're in the right place. That's the starting point. And there is no book on tech law. So there is no magical course which will tell you all about the next big thing and how to deal with new technology. It would make no sense whatsoever for a course like that to exist. I'm telling you, the most important slide in the presentation is the one which I've not put into this presentation. The next slide, the next chapter in the evolution of technology and law. So again, be inquisitive, start from technology and what you like, what you're passionate about, and ask yourself questions. I think that's the, the best place to start. That's my personal opinion, of course. Sure, thanks, Alex. Um, that's great. Um, I just had one more question, that's all right, about in, in relation to that. You know, in, with your expertise, um, 
basically I, I travel quite a bit and like uh, I've been to places like um, Dubai in Japan and there's been more of a, more like a, a visible presence of technology there so for example in terms of security um, there's quite a few you know in Dubai now you've got um, ro- almost you've got Robocops that wheel around on uh, you know rolling on technology in Japan I think they've got someone there as well that's um, like police and it's essentially bought by robots when Europe I've not seen as much as a visible presence do you think um, that's down to like a difference in culture or investment or like the, the law might be different but what's your perspective on that if that makes sense yeah it does I mean it's it's a very complex question uh, I think it's all of the above really I mean it's about uh, centralized governments are quicker in adopting new technology some countries have made technological development their main goal uh, yeah. going moving forward. So uh, you you would expect those countries to be at the forefront of technological development. Um, there's a lot about, for example, you you, you were talking about uh, police, robotic police. Of course, a country which uh, feels that security is um, very very important, perhaps more than individual rights, would be more inclined to adopt new technology and law enforcement, whereas perhaps uh, more traditional countries, um, you know, I'm talking about Europe, might be more inclined to be slightly more prudent and talk about it before implementing, you know, robotics in law enforcement. So perhaps uh, there might be even, you know, democracy is a bit like this, right? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of this discussing and there's a lot of conversation about just how to uh, put technology on the road, on the streets, and have it interact safely and efficiently with the population. So again, if you think about it, um, liability comes to mind. So you know who takes liability for what these Robocops do? Who programs them? Mm. Uh, what are their functions? Can they inflict bodily harm? Are they just supposed to be surveillance drones? I mean, it's all about, again, as I said, understanding technology, uh, seeing what technology does, and then asking yourself the questions. So again, I would I would suspect that you know these are basically robots designed to uh, provide surveillance ser- surveillance services. But again, it's interesting. Uh, these countries are perhaps more inclined to uh, be early adopters, which is fine. But uh, asking yourself the right questions about okay, so but is it safe? Uh, how about individual rights? Can I be arrested by a robot? That's a question for you. Is it can a rat be badly, you know, completed by robots? Yeah, right. That's uh. That's have you watched? Um, have you watched I Am Legend? You know, I'm film. Legend, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I robot. Sorry, I robot. Yeah, okay. I robot. Yeah. <laughs> that's like uh, 50 years from now, I think. <laughs> if the, no, if, if they come yeah, into power. But yeah, mate. Thanks a lot for your question. Uh, your your um, insight. Appreciate it a lot. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Danny, for your question. Uh, I mean, I didn't know Robocops were a thing, so it looks like they are now. So a bit of insight from the audience there as well. Um, so I think we have a question. I think we've got about five more minutes. So we've been here about an hour, roughly. So in the interest of time, the speaker's time, etc. cetera, um, uh, if any of you guys have any questions, please feel free to post in the chat now, um, as we've only got about five minutes or so left. Uh, however, we do have a question from uh, Niccolo. Niccolo. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Uh, ciao Alessandro, and thanks for, for your insightful presentation. Uh, your, as I said before in the chat, your legal and fintech knowledge and your communication skills are impressive. And I also appreciate your philosophical way of always uh, asking questions. Why this? Uh, how? What is the implication of that? Uh, my question question actually was uh, very similar to Matteo, but uh, I uh, I was afraid he was stealing my question, but uh, at the end it uh, was not, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so uh, you proved us that innovation is not, uh, let's say, a bad, um, a bad word in law firms. Um, but uh, in my opinion, uh, and also according to some uh, to some researches, uh, the, compli- the compliance part uh, and the law uh, are uh, still, um, in a certain way, uh, making uh, some uh, difficulties uh, and slowing uh, innovation. For example, there are several research by 
Professor Levine on, on patents, they show that patents are, um, are slowing innovation. Or, for example, the antitrust is another way, uh, with, uh, with another fact, another institution that is slowing also the, the growing of those technological firms. And uh, recently, I was reading a book called uh, Hey, I Superpowers by Kai Fu Lee. Uh, which shows us the difference between uh, the mindset uh, also from uh, a legal and competition point of view between the uh, US and China. So my question would be a more geographical one. Uh, the difference between Europe, US and China that uh, I've seen, uh, of course, I'm not a I have not legal background, uh, I'm a, I have a business background, but uh, uh, in my view is that the European law is more uh, about regulation. Um, in China, for example, is an environment in which there is a tremendous competition, in which uh, if you want to start a startup, uh, you have to grow fast, uh, tremendously fast, uh, and how to be the best one in this. In the US, uh, um, in my view, has changed the, the, the path. Uh, at the beginning, it was not so regulated, but in the last years, those, uh, let's say, lobbies of tech have uh, uh, enrich the, the, the number of patents and the number of regulations. So, what is your opinion? Uh, which is the best system to, 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 to enroll, to start uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a community, in a, in a country, uh, from a legal point of view? Uh, well, thank you for your question. It's, uh, I guess that's uh, another broad question. Uh, broad question. And I, I think I, I'm not... Um, well, I, I, I don't think I can answer that uh, specifically, but I will say this. To begin with, um, you must understand the law is a compromise. It's, it's all about compromise. It's about balancing different interests and, you know, different point of views into something which, you know, resembles sufficiency and, you know, something which is good. Uh, hopefully it's very, very good, but even if it's just good, then it's fine. Then it's a good compromise. And uh, it's uh, a uh, the result of multiple interests coming into play. So in a country such as China, the cultural background is different. The way the system, the society is organized is different. So you will, you are bound to see the effects of that different system in the legal framework and, and the, you know, the legal context in which startups and companies, uh, you know, the, work and, and are born and, and will develop. So I guess it, it depends. It depends on, for example, what you're into, what activity you, you want to uh, provide, um, and, you know, what, what kind of long-term objectives you, you, you have. So let me just give you an example. If you're in Europe that, and you create something, a product, a service, and you are very, very aware and cognizant of the human implications, the human rights, and how this must fit within a very, very diverse community, which is, you know, very sensitive to uh, the issue of balancing different interests and different cultures and somehow the democratic, the, the democracy of the process, then of course, uh, Europe is the good place to be because you are ready to face the specificities of the European system, which is very, very protective. We were just discussing this before, you know, connecting and deep going online uh, on GDPR, for example, data protection. So we have very, very uh, rigorous data protection laws in Europe. And interestingly enough, you find in California rules which are similar, but other American states which are more, I would say, well, less concerned with the intricacies of data protection, you will not find data protection law as complex in those states. So again, it really depends what your goals are. But I would say in general, um, Europe is a very stimulating environment if you are ready to deal with complex regulation and multi-level regulation. If instead, and so are the United States. So the difference between federal law and state law is something you must be concerned with. Some states are more liberal and tend to provide you with, you know, ample uh, space uh, to develop and, and even not from a regulatory point of view. If instead you feel that, you know, you're providing something, you know, a product or service, 
which is perfectly in line and compatible with you know China, the Chinese context, then of course China will be the right place for you. But again, it depends. There is no best place. It really depends on what your goals are, how, how many, you know, how many how much resources you're willing to spend in dealing with complex issues and balancing acts and whatnot. So it's all about you know the starting points and what you want to do, your goals and your activity. I'm, I'm sorry, this is all a very it depends kind of answer, but it depends really. Um, very, very different systems. I would suggest always looking at these systems based on your product, your service, your long-term objectives. Uh, because that's, I think that's key to understanding which jurisdiction would be more helpful in you know, assisting and supporting your development. Thank you for your question, Nicola, and thank you for your answer. I mean, yeah, that's that's interesting. I guess it does it does depend. A lot of what is at stake depends. I mean, everything is changing so fast. There's so many uncertainties. Uh, everything is up for interpretation. That it really is a question of it depends. So um, appreciate that. So um, I think we will close off now with the last question, given that it's uh, we're over by about two minutes. Uh, from Ivan has a question. Yes, Matteo, I don't know if uh, Calada maybe has a question he needs to leave uh, very soon. Uh, Caladia, Calada, can you give us a few? Oh, oh sorry about that. I missed out, the, uh, I missed out her comment. Um, so, uh, oh, Cal, 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 sorry. Yeah, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, so he's... Uh, He's, he's saying, oh no, he's, he, put, he put in a comment saying a very insightful presentation um, and he would like to revisit this topic offline. So okay. if that's all right with you, because I think he had a call, if that's all right with you, Alessandro, he may contact you offline sure. with a question yeah. or something like that. Okay, perfect. Um, yep. Just left the meeting, so I may come in with a, a very quick question, I hope. And it is the, the following, say a comparison almost. Uh, I've had experience of uh, the patenting, uh, uh, say, point of view on the law. So on the European uh, basis, uh, it is forming, uh, uh, um, say, uh, an organism that will be able to judge on uh, issue concerning patents on the European levels. Since I think that uh, uh, patenting on inventions is something that, of course, needs to be worldwide, and since we are going towards uh, decentralized uh, ledgers, so blockchains, for example, that are by nature worldwide, I'm thinking, will it be ever be the time for, uh, say, a universal uh, the central ledger, the the central ledger, uh, say, uh, trial or something like that? Will we ever have a, a worldwide organization uh, which uh, will do on the centralized ledgers? Well, that's uh, well, that's a that's a big d dream, right? Uh, about you know having uh, a central judge, uh, a global judge, a global government, a, a global way of resolving issues. Um, I would say that globalization and decentralization are um, a very very powerful engine to spur this kind of unification, at least on some level. So, just to give you an idea. Um, if you have an ICO, an initial coin offering, and you use the blockchain to issue these tokens, and basically the entire issuance is decentralized, this begs the question, where are you issuing from? Which, you know, what country is your place of origin? And the answer is probably no place, no country. It's decentralized, it's global. So, as I said, it's considering, well, there are difficulties. I mean, if you think about it, international law has only given us hints to global forms of, you know, um, collaboration and, and, you know, dispute, dispute resolution, and they're only partial. Countries are still very much sovereign, and they tend to deal with their own law uh, in, in a very territorial way, of course. But as I said, there is a paradigm shift here, and it's about, I guess, technology being a unifier and suggesting that some issues could receive effective solutions and be resolved effectively at the global level. And if you think about it, historically, this has happened with Europe. 
uh, you know, being close together, all these countries and in a common space and having a lot of commerce going on between these member states, then of course we developed a common market and as this progresses we are unifying and harmonizing our rules. So the financial banking world are very, very much harmonized. Uh, PSD2, Payment Services Directive, you know, the same across Europe. Um, so we are getting there and we've, we're seeing that technology, so providing, you know, services over the internet is pushing the kind of process forward because of course the internet is already a unifying force. And if on top of the internet, you add on a decentralization layer, then clearly it's another step in that direction. We're talking about something which could, you know, could possibly be effectively ruled at the global level but clearly this is a very very long process and we would have to have all countries on board or at least you know the, the major players on board so i think uh while the objective is sound and uh in fact i i can relate i i would see a lot of benefits coming from you know global solutions but we must still contend with the specificities and the national identities and you know in this day and age especially uh, how you know the western bloc and china are kind of interacting uh, also on a technological scale and then of course it, it might not be uh you know uh, um, low-hanging fruit uh, but it might take a while to get there but of course we're getting there the technology is actually showing us how decentralization and globalization is you know right there something we must contend with and hopefully this will bring us to uh, common rules across across the globe so you know the dream of having a common framework that's possibly where we're heading okay thank you very much for your answer yeah, welcome. thank thank you alessandro for your answers and your presentation so i think uh given time and the questions i think this ends uh this uh oh it ends blockchain july for us at aitb um so i would like to thank everyone who's joined this call um and obviously the presenter alessandro thank you for your time and your effort in putting this presentation together and for your insights is really uh, insightful so i guess uh, the closing note for me is that you have a dream alessandro which is to have common legal frameworks uh, in the future uh, so we'll see what what happens uh, so this so this session is being recorded um, so this you can find you will be able to find this uh, presentation uh, online later on we'll post on our YouTube page and on our LinkedIn page uh, so we can make sure that as, mu as many people as possible can see the useful information which Alessandra has shared. Um, so that is that really. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining and uh, we'll see you very soon. And most importantly, thank you, Alessandra. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.